welcome you here to our worship service at the First United Methodist Church of Interlochen. I'm so glad you tuned in today and are going to be taking part in our worship service as we celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for taking your time to do this. You could have chosen to do anything, but you thought of the Lord, you thought of God, and you wanted to worship, so you tuned in, and I appreciate your attention. I really do. Just by way of announcement, Tomorrow, Monday, which is February the 8th, there'll be the Ladies' Bible Study at 1 o'clock at the Parsonage. And then on February the 10th at 10 a.m. will be United Methodist Women at the Parsonage. So feel free to take part in one of those two meetings, ladies, that are out there. Good women's ministry, good opportunity for you to get involved. Social distancing is observed. People do wear masks, and so you can feel safe in that environment. Let's go to the Lord now in a word of prayer before we look into the scriptures. Let's pray. Father, how grateful we are for you in the midst of a changing world. I thank you that you do not change. You tell us that you are a rock in the Old Testament, and the book of Hebrews says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you for your faithfulness and your constancy, and that you are the Lord God who does not change. Father, we look and put our trust and hope in you during these times. I do pray for the vaccine to be distributed widely for people to get help. Pray as many people could get it as older folks in the congregation. Please help us, Father, during this time. We put all of our trust in you and pray now you would quiet our hearts, still our minds as we look into the word of God. Thank you, Father, for you. In Christ's name. If you'd like to turn to James chapter 2, we're going to be doing a study of James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. So if you do have a Bible with you, make sure you're there in the book of James. Also, at the end of our service, we are going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper together and have Holy Communion. So make sure you have a little bit of grape juice, a small piece of bread, so that you can take part in the service at that time. If you want to hit pause and go get the elements, that's fine can do that. Good thing about the computer situation. Let's look now and take a look at James chapter 2. I don't know about you out there listening, but I love ice cream. I scream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. I've never known a person that doesn't like ice cream. And I can remember being a young boy up on my grandparents' farm in Virginia and then making homemade ice cream with the old churn that you had to crank by hand. And that ice cream was so good. There was peach ice cream, vanilla ice cream, different flavors. I also remember as a small boy going to Howard Johnson's. And back in those days, they advertised 33 different flavors. And I always loved chocolate chip ice cream. Besides ice cream, we all have favorite foods, don't we? My mother made a dynamic spaghetti sauce that was a real thick meat sauce that was so good. We all have favorite foods. A lot of men, it's steak and potatoes. A lot of different people like certain chicken dishes. And we all have favorite ice creams, favorite foods, different things that we like. 
And that is fine to do because we're all individuals of a different taste. But when it comes to interacting with people in the church, the last thing we need to do is ever play favorites. And James is going to address that here in chapter 2 of his general epistle as he's writing to different churches. Remember, he's writing to Hebrew Christians that are dispersed all throughout the Middle Eastern world. And he's telling them to be aware of playing favorites. So if you would look with me in chapter 2, verse 1. James says, My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, talking here to Christians, those that know Christ personally, have accepted him as Savior, as believers in our glorious uh, Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Don't show favoritism. Folks, favoritism and giving one person more emphasis and more worth than another person is clearly against the whole gospel message. Paul told the Galatians in Christ, there's no longer slave or free, there's no longer male or female, there's no longer Hebrew or Greek, but you're all one in Christ. And all people are of equal value in God's eyes, so we can't show favoritism. Now James paints a picture here of a situation, and let's break that down as we go into verse 2. He says, Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. So a person comes in, and it's obviously they're well-to-do by the way they're dressed, okay? And also a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. So you have just an ordinary person that doesn't have many funds. He's just dressed in ordinary clothes, okay? If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit on the floor by my feet. You don't even offer the guy a nice chair to sit in, okay? Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Notice that last clause. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You know, folks, I believe in many ways that James is here talking especially to preachers and to pastors. You know, sadly to say, a lot of pastors, they want their church to grow, which is a good thing. They'd like their offerings to grow, which is a good thing. They want to see the church grow, and that's a positive idea to see the church grow, to see people come to know Christ as Savior, come into the congregation and take part of the worship services and become a disciple. After all, the mission of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples for Jesus Christ and work toward the transformation of the world. So that's a good goal to have. But sometimes we try to do godly things in a very worldly way. And sadly to say, a lot of pastors have been guilty of seeing somebody that comes into the church visiting, who's dressed well off, appears to be wealthy, and think, hey, this guy could possibly be a big giver. I got to get him into the church. So you treat him with a lot of respect. You shake his hand. You speak to him. You try to give him one of the finest seats in the congregation with the goal that hopefully he'll join and possibly become a big giver. If you have that kind of an attitude, James says right here, uh, real clearly, have you not become judges with evil thoughts? We have to treat all people fairly and treat anybody that walks in through the door with as much value as we treat everybody else. You know, I think it's very, very important for a pastor to remember he's called to serve God to do the work of God, to preach and teach the word of God and equip people for ministry and not get caught on how much the finances are. What you give to God financially is between you and the Lord. That's something you have to pray about, you have to think about, you have to study the scriptures on tithing and giving and decide, this is what I'm going to do for the Lord. I myself make it a point not to know what anybody gives here in the church. I don't want to know what anybody gives so that I don't wind up, you know, even unsuspectedly showing somebody a little bit more favoritism than somebody else. Uh, we have the money collected in the offering. Dottie is a treasure, is the one that counts the money with help from another lady or two. 
and they take care of making the bank deposit, I don't know who gives what. And I don't want to know because that keeps me pure in the way I treat the flock of God. And I think that's a very, very important thing. It would be real natural for a congregational member or a pastor, an elder, or somebody like that to try to think, wow, this person could really help us out a whole lot. This treating special. But we should never have that kind of an attitude. All men are made in the image of God, it tells us back in the book of Genesis. And we should treat everybody just as equal as we treat everybody else. So James says, don't do this. Don't show favoritism back in, in verse 1. And then he gives this example of the rich being treated better than poor people. He goes on in verse 5 to develop this theme and says, listen, my dear brothers. Remember last week we talked about two ears and one mouth. We ought to listen as twice as long as we speak. He wants us to listen to this. First, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and then to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? You know, it's interesting when you go back and study church history, you find that a lot of the early Christians were slaves in the Roman Empire. They were actually owned by somebody else. The possessions and things they owned were very meager and very small if they actually owned anything at all. And a lot of common, ordinary people that believed in Jesus and accepted him were among the lower classes of people. So in some ways, they were very honored because it says here that God has chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith. Remember around Christmas time when we talked about Mary and Joseph and how they took Jesus on the eighth day to be circumcised in the temple and they had to give an offering and you were supposed to bring a lamb, but if you couldn't afford it, you could bring a pair of turtle doves or young pigeons that's exactly what Mary and Joseph brought because they couldn't afford a lamb. They were among the lower classes. So often somebody that we might not think too highly of is highly favored in God's eyes. Because you never know how God is going to use that person and the impact that person will have. So that's the first argument James gives to not be a person who gives shows favoritism towards wealthy people. Then he says, but... You have insulted the poor if you act that way toward people and devalue people without a lot of wealth. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Hey, James is talking about this. The people would have been exactly known if they were slaves. They were exploited on a daily basis. They were taken advantage of by rich people. Rich people tried to get as much work possibly out of them as they could at the lowest expenditure. And it's sad to say, but that's the kind of things that were going on and what wealthy people have always done in the past. Are not they the ones who are dragging you into court? They would often try to take people to court to even get more out of them and different things like that. Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? A lot of these wealthy people were actually slandering Christ's name not believing in God, not having accepted Jesus as their Savior, they were basically putting the holy name down that Christians had come to trust in. So James really wants them to take a look about how they treat people that come in and realize that God has a tendency to favor the poor in some ways above the rich, though he loves all men. Jesus had a ministry to Joseph of Arimathea, who was a wealthy man, to Nicodemus, who was a wealthy Pharisee, but he also reached out and touched the woman at the well, touched the blind beggar and healed people. Jesus looked at people indiscriminately and knew that everybody was in need of a savior. Whether you have a million dollars or you live paycheck to paycheck, you need a savior. And Jesus knew that and ministered to people from all different walks of life. He goes on secondly and says here in verse eight, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture. Notice he refers to it as the royal law. It's something that God has given, that the king has given. Here's the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. Remember what Jesus told the disciples in the Gospels 
a new commandment that I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know you're my disciples indeed, if you have love one toward another. And that's the royal law of love. Love one another. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. You have the same concern for them as you would for your very self. Love your neighbor as yourself. But, in contrast, if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Favoritism is clearly sin, clearly the wrong thing to do, and exactly what God would have us not to do. You know, in many ways, the way the Bible paints the picture of a church, a church is to be one big extended family. It's supposed to be the body of Christ. And I think that's what we really have here at First UMC Interlochen. We have a big family. Paul even speaks in the pastoral epistles to Timothy and says, consider older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, younger men as brothers, and older men as fathers. We have that fatherly family kind of relationship that God would have us to have. And that's what I've always liked about this church here. The last 17 years I've been involved with it. It is one big family. And I don't think we do show a lot of favoritism here. I really don't think we do. Anybody that walks in that door, regardless of who they are, is accepted and offered a place in our community. So we're doing the right thing if we love our neighbor as ourselves. But if you show favoritism, you sin or are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever, verse 10, keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, quotes one of the Ten Commandments, also said, do not murder, another one of the Ten Commandments. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. So folks, favoritism is nothing we can slip into. And as I think about a message this morning that I'm sharing with you all, this is more preventative than it is actually convicting because we definitely are a body. So make sure we always treat everybody with respect that comes through that door. Everybody's equal. We're all equal. We all put our pants on the same way, men, and that's so, so important. You know, we've also got to be aware sometimes, too, of making the church into a good old boys club and favoring men over women. That's something we shouldn't do either because everybody is equal in God's eyes. And I praise God for Georgiana and the ladies' Bible study. I praise God for UNW and the ministries that are reaching out to the ladies to show that they're just as valuable as men. Whether you're rich or poor, you're valuable in God's eyes. Whether you're male or female, race should not ever play a, a, a prominent portion in a church either. We should be open to all different kind of races, all different kind of peoples, because we are all made in the image of God. Then after James goes over this scenario, shows where it's sin, shows us how to behave, he finishes this up here with verses 12 and 13. He says, speak and act. Remember last week, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves, okay? We've got to act on this. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. You know, one good thing about the law of Christ, about what God is talking to us, is that we are free in Christ. We have freedom in Christ Paul says that if any of you are in Christ, you have freedom now. You're free in Christ to move around. We have that great freedom that he offers us. Anybody that's, that those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. You know what I find sometimes when somebody else does something wrong, it's a, really a lot easier to sit up on a throne of judgment and say, hey, look what he did. He deserves to be judged. He deserves to be punished. But when I do something wrong, man, I cry out for mercy. We ought to be merciful people and realize we're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to fall short of things. We're all not going to be exactly what we should be all the time. 
You'll have a rough day from time to time. You'll be antagonistic towards somebody or you'll treat somebody harsh. Try to be a person that is merciful. Why? No mercy will be shown to anyone who has not shown mercy. But if you show mercy, it says mercy triumphs over judgment. After all, what does the cross, just like the one we have here on the altar, represent? God is a merciful God. If God had given us justice, we would all be in hell for all eternity. The soul that sinneth, it shall die, it says in the Old Testament. But God, by the cross, shows us pure mercy that we can be forgiven. The psalmist said, Lord, if you were to mark down all our iniquities, who would stand? The implied answer, nobody at all. But, he says, there is mercy with you, and God shows us mercy with Jesus Christ. So, folks, to wrap it up in a nutshell, let me encourage you, keep doing what you're doing. Let's keep the spirit that we have here at First United interlocking the way it's always been, a church of one big family where everybody's accepted, everybody's welcomed. We don't show favoritism toward one person or the other. As a pastor, I have to always make sure I maintain that attitude and don't favor people above another. How many times have I had somebody tell me, well, I used to go to that church, but there were so many cliques I could never fit in. There's bound to be cliques of people that develop. But here at Interlock, and we can work against that and not have those cliques develop. Being a smaller church, being a family-oriented church, I praise God that we're not that way. But let's all make sure that we always work hard toward maintaining that spirit of unity. The spirit of unity and the bond of peace the Apostle Paul talks about. And that's such a beautiful thing. And what is that royal law? Love your neighbor as yourself. I would never harm myself. I'll never harm my neighbor. Anybody that comes through the door is just as valuable to God as any one of us is. And we need to remember that. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for James and the spirit that he gives us here about treating people and loving people just as much as ourselves. And I pray by your grace, you would fill us with the spirit and give us the power to do this and behave this way. Thank you for what we have here, Father, in Interlochen, and I pray your spirit would continue to fill us all and help us continue doing the things we've done so long for so many years. Father, we put all of our trust in you. In Christ's name, amen. Folks, at this time, we're going to have our Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper. So hopefully you have your elements there with you. If you don't, you might want to hit pause and go get a small piece of bread and a small container of grape juice. Christ invites to the table all who believe in him, have repented of their sins, and want to follow him in a life of discipleship. And at this time, we will observe the Lord's Supper. Scripture says, on the night in which he gave himself for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to the Father, broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being the bread of life. Jesus said, I myself am the bread of life. And thank you, Father, for giving yourself up for each one of us as your body was broken. The nails that pierced your feet and hands, the crown of thorns, Jesus, that was placed down upon your brow. We remember now your broken body, which was given for us as we partake. Amen. Let's partake at this time. The scripture goes on to say, after the dinner, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me.
The hymn writer said, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's partake at this time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the precious blood of Jesus Christ, slain before the foundation of the world as a lamb without spot or blemish. Thank you, Father, that we were not redeemed with worthless things such as silver and gold, according to the tradition of our forefathers, but we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot and mercy. Thank you, Father, for giving us mercy and grace through the cross, accepting us as your children, adopting us, bringing us to yourself, justifying us as if we'd never sinned because of Christ taking our place on the cross. Thank you so much, Father, for what Jesus' blood means to each one of us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father. In Christ's name, amen. Folks, I do hope you've been blessed this morning as we've studied the book of James. I'm continuing doing a series working our way through James. And this passage about favoritism is so, so, so important. Let's make sure we maintain that spirit among ourselves, accept everybody as equal, and do what God would have us to do. Amen. Thank you for being with us.